Yes. So, you know, we're, we're, we're given this time period and in a big way, there's not a whole lot that any individual can do to change things. There's not a whole lot I can do to change things. I know that. And, but what, what can I change is what's important. What do I have control over is what's really important. You know, and I don't have control over what's happening on Rodeo Drive or at the Beverly Center or in Minneapolis or in downtown or in the hospitals or in the air or in that microscopic world of the viruses. I have no control of that. And I wish I did but probably nobody else would wish I did because i probably screw it up. But so, you know, the, the, there's a poem I'm going to go over about this and about this, something that really relates to this time period. And to take take this ideas, these ideas in. And, you know, what, what makes the difference now between, I think, a sane survival and spinning out into destruction or self-destruction is how we meet this time. I'm very, very much impacted by the Darwinian idea of survival of the fittest and then change to survival of the most adaptable. And that doesn't mean the strongest, that's a misnomer. But it means the ones that can adapt to changes. You know, I talk about the I Ching a lot, which is the book of changes. It is a way to navigate times of change, times of uncertainty, times when we don't know what's going on. But there's even a deeper level of this that we've learned in ceremony and in life and must be put into practice now must be, because survival is literally at stake. Healthy survival, survival with a good spirit, survival with a sane mind. I've been watching many people going crazy online, of course many people getting spun out and being spun out by what we talked about last week, which is a lot of the conspiracy theories spreading around. And people losing themselves. People losing themselves and surrendering their minds, their thoughts, their ideas to being programmed by somebody else. One of my big theories of life is that, you know, a person can learn a lot in this life. You can learn whatever you want to learn that's available to be learned. You can learn. You can learn to be an artist. You can learn to be a musician. You can learn to be a secretary or an executive, you can learn business, you can learn so much stuff. You can learn to be a minister or a rabbi. You can learn to be a philosopher. And this is what I call additive knowledge. Knowledge that gets added upon you by the outside world. 
knowledge that Rumi said is from the outside to the inside. And then there's wisdom, a second kind of knowledge that begins on the inside and percolates into the outside. So knowledge you add, and for wisdom, it's almost as though it's a subtractive process. Because Buddha, sitting in meditation, did not think about conspiracies, did not think about anything, but his was a letting go. And the question becomes, what are we when we let go all the way? What are we when we really let go? Who are we? How are we? And this is the pathway through this. This is the core of the wisdom teachings. Not religions, but the wisdom teachings. If you take everything away that you think you are, who are you? Who were you at that moment of the first breath? Who will you be at the moment of the last breath? Before, there was no Holly or Yannicka or Karen or Lacey or anybody else here. After, those things will be gone too. So what is it within that's real? That doesn't have the name, that doesn't have the identity, that doesn't have the neurosis, that doesn't have the fear, that doesn't have the anger, that doesn't have the jealousy, that doesn't have the pain. At some point, I think a person realizes, you recognize that that's the sole purpose of human life. If it's all going to be taken away except one thing, does it not behoove the human being to find that one thing? Does it not behoove each one of us to really do the necessary work, the meditation, the practice, the releasing, the letting go, to the point where where you're sitting, there's nothing but you. Not the history, not the future, not the past, but just the infinite moment of the eternal now. This is what the purpose is, and this is what, to me, is why the world is so messed up. Henrietta said, is it possible that the comfort we had was an illusion? It's not possible it was an illusion, it was an illusion. <laughs> you know, external comfort's gonna always be an illusion, and here's why. Here's why. Rumi said, everything you see has its roots in the unseen world. The forms may change. I would change that to the forms will change. But the essence remains the same. Every beautiful sight will vanish. Every sweet word will fade. But do not be disheartened. The source they come from is eternal. And so, yes, those comforts that we, we had are the things that are changing now. You know, the comforts that we had are what is changing. And none of us know where this is going. Nobody knows. It's the thing about why I'm not a conspiracy theorist is because the conspiracy theory posits that somebody knows what's going on. And I really don't think that that is true or possible right now. I think we're in unknown territory. 
for the first time ever in human history, ever, 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 right now, today, the world is having a joint experience. I was on a conference yesterday and there were some Amazonian shamans speaking from the middle of the Peruvian and the Colombian Amazon. And guess what they were talking about? COVID-19. And I'm sure wherever you go in the world right now, that'll be the topic of conversation, except the United States where it's going to be the riots and COVID-19. But for the first time, the world is having a unified experience that is in many ways bringing our consciousness, bringing our souls together. This makes this an incredibly valuable time. Weeks ago, I talked about the Chinese character for opportunity, and it has character for crisis within it. Because the deeper the crisis, the greater the opportunity. I didn't make this up. I mean, I didn't create this. You didn't create this. This is just what is. And what I wanted to, to do is read this poem and go over it a little bit. It's from the Tao Te Ching, the Book of Wisdom by Lao Tzu. And very, very old. The story was Lao Tzu was a wandering sage in China. I don't remember when, a long, long time ago. And he didn't write anything. He didn't write any books. Nobody copied his words down. He just taught wherever he was. And then one day it became time for him to leave. Leaving China, in this case. And he went to the border of China, and I believe Tibet, where the border crossing was, and the guards were to protect the border. Borders go back a long time. And the guard recognized who he was and begged him before he left to write down his teachings. And so he wrote a book called the Tao Te Ching, which means the way of the changes or the way of harmony through the changes. Chinese is complex, it has many meanings. So this is one of the stanzas in the Tao Te Ching that I think really, really points to these times. And I'm gonna go over it line by line. The master sees things as they are. And in this case, you know, the word master could be teacher, it could also be one who has mastered something or even better mastered themselves. Sees things as they are. One of the stanzas in the Tao Te Ching says, see a tree as a tree. You know, because our mind wants to place significance upon everything. It's a, you know, I have, I have people ask me all the time, I had a dream of an animal, what does this mean? You know, what's the significance of this particular tree? What's the significance of this particular vision? I always say, see it as it is. How do you hear an animal speak? You watch it. You listen. You watch how it moves. You know, often when I'm taking my walks, I meet dogs. And dogs that are not friendly to anybody else are friendly to me, except one nasty little dog. 
but most dogs are really friendly to me. And uh, people will kind of ask me, like, well, how do you do this? And I say, I speak dog. You know, I know their, I watch their body move. I watch where their eyes go. I've learned when they're doing something, what they're trying to say. Because they have a definite, specific language. Every creature does. You know, so the master sees things as they are. See a tree as a tree. How easy it is to go off into the permutations of the mind with trying to find significance in things. Can I find, can I know the significance of a virus? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> made a post, it's like, what COVID-19 is saying. Should have been SARS-CoV, you know, too, instead of COVID-19, but, you know, it was, it was like, it was humorous to me because here's a person who thinks that the virus is speaking English to them. A virus with no brain no consciousness that we know of. Just very good at reproducing in human bodies. So, see it as it is. The next sentence is really hard without trying to control them. See things exactly as they are without trying to control them. So, where does trying to control come from? From the mind. You know, trying to control, trying to use my mental anguish or my mental angst or my mental whatever it is to change reality. So cease things as they are without trying to control them. He lets them go their own way. One of the parts of uh, the Chinese philosophy that I love is the idea of being like a cloud. Somebody asked a question on one of the science sites, what does it feel like to touch a cloud? It doesn't feel like anything. You know, I used to wonder that when I was flying, when I was a kid, it's like, whoa, can I, if I could reach out and touch the clouds, what would happen? Nothing. But the cloud moves where the cloud moves. It doesn't try to move. It doesn't have a goal in mind. It doesn't have a desire. It just moves with the wind without trying to control them. He lets them go their own way and resides at the center of the circle. This one's also very hard. He understands that the universe is forever out of control and that trying to dominate events goes against the current of the Tao. Yeah, that one's hard. How can a human being live in knowingness that there's nothing that they're in control of outside of themselves. I was listening to a talk today about control. And it's like, we think we can control reality. We're gonna die. The earth is gonna die. The sun is gonna die. The moon is gonna die. The solar system is going to die. The galaxy is going to die. Everything has its end. Maybe some of those are inconceivably far in the future. 
but everything has its end point. What doesn't have the end point is the center of the circle. According to sages, according to wise beings, according to saints, according to real gurus, according to these things, these beings. And that trying to dominate them goes against the current of the Tao. So in Taoism, you know, that idea of the cloud, of what's it like just to flow, just to let go. I used to think that that would lead to disaster in this world. What if nobody did anything? So one morning I woke up and I thought to myself, I am not going to do anything today. I'm just going to sit. It was not a good day to do this because I had a patient at 10 o'clock in my office. So I said, I'm just going to sit and see what happens and not try to do anything, not try to do anything. And I found myself getting up out of bed. I found myself brushing my teeth. I found myself taking a shower, eating a little breakfast, getting in my car, driving to the office, treating patients, but from an entirely different place. You can drink a glass of water, you can try to drink a glass of water. Trying to drink the glass of water is dominating. Drinking the glass of water, when it's done in peace and calmness and observation, is going with the current of the Tao, letting go. It doesn't mean you won't accomplish anything. It just means that it's no longer angst-driven, it's no longer fear-driven, it's no longer pain-driven. This one, this gets increasingly difficult, okay. Be content with what you have. Be content with what you have. This is a challenge in this time. It's especially a challenge when things get taken away. when the clouds that were so together go in separate directions, when the things that brought comfort no longer exist. There's a story. I heard this many, many years ago of a king who was also a sage. He lived in a grand palace. Everything was beautiful, magical. Everything was amazing. Beautiful courtiers, beautiful concubines, beautiful staff, beautiful grounds, plants, peacocks, pheasants. You know, everything so beautiful. And one day a yogi came to the king's court because this king would see whoever wanted to come to see him and hear their complaints or their needs. And the great yogi said, King, how can you call yourself a sage? Look at you. You're surrounded by luxury. You should renounce it all. And the king said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you something about life. 
And he called one of the guards and said, bring this man a bowl, a golden bowl of water filled to the brim, filled to the brim. And the guard handed this to this great yogi. And the king said, guard, take your sword out of your sheath. And if one drop of this water spills, cut his head off. And he said to the yogi, now I'm going to take you on a tour, or have you taken on a tour of these be this beautiful palace? But if one drop spills, no more head. So a couple hours pass, and the king is on his throne, and the yogi comes back very carefully carrying this bowl of water. And the guard takes it away. And the king says, did you enjoy my palace? And the yogi said, what palace? All I saw was the bowl of water. And the king says, yes, this is the lesson. This is the intensity with which you must focus on your heart, on knowing yourself, on finding what you are. And the king said, I have all this. It'll all be gone someday. But who I am will not be gone. Rejoice in the way things are. Gain, loss, victory, defeat, pain, pleasure, the dichotomies of life. Can I rejoice in the pain the same as I rejoice in the pleasure? Can I rejoice in the challenges the same that I enjoy, rejoice in the times of ease and beauty? Such a simple poem and it's so difficult, such a challenge. And it's so easy in times of difficulty to let those times of difficulty drag you into the pits. It's so difficult in times of difficulty to maintain yourself at the center of the circle. Open, focusing on that bowl of water. Focusing on the heart, focusing on the love. And then this one is very, we're, we're past the difficult part here. Um, well, not quite. The last stanza, the last set line says, when you realize there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. When you realize there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. This is the essence of Taoism. Like many other things, it got very complex after the time of Lao Tzu. But this was the very simplest beginning of it all. What does it feel like? Imagine it if you can't feel it to know that everything is just exactly as it is. There's nothing you can do to change it. And whatever is there right now is enough. It's a gift. Whatever it is about life, I know that life is a gift most precious of all gifts. 
the biggest diamond is the world, and the world is, I believe it's the hope diamond, the most valuable. Would you trade that for your life? Life is more valuable. So realizing that nothing is lacking creates a consciousness that's totally open to receiving the gift of the moment, if it's painful or if it's pleasure. Because even in the fear, even in the pain, even in the anger, even in the joy and the love and the beauty and the connection, you are still exactly who you are. You are still capable of experiencing love or experiencing fear. In the course of mir course in miracle course of miracles course in miracles, the first line and it's about as far as I ever got in the book because it was so good I didn't want to ruin it by reading the rest of the book. First line is there's only two things that exist: love and fear, and the fear isn't real. You know, so that means that it's only the love that exists. That means it's only the peace that exists, it's only the joy that exists. And the rest of it is temporary illusion. There will be a time, hopefully very soon, but there will be a time when COVID-19 becomes a memory and nothing but a memory. There will be a time, hopefully very, very, very soon, when the civil unrest we're going through is over. It will become just a note in history books. Everything that has a beginning has an end. Very difficult to see that in the middle. Very difficult to see that in the middle. Because we're not wired for that. We're not wired to see, yes, this will end. This too shall pass. It's very important to hold that. This too shall pass. You too will pass, but this too shall pass. So reside at the center of the circle. You know, I'm going to read the whole thing start to finish. The master sees things as they are without trying to control them. He lets them go their own way and resides at the center of the circle. She understands that the universe is forever out of control and that trying to dominate events goes against the current of the Tao. Be content with what you have. Rejoice in the way things are. When you realize there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. So when I realize nothing is lacking in my life, you know, it's like if you don't own anything, you own everything. If you have nothing, you have everything. 
There's no need to grasp. No need to be afraid. Especially no need to be afraid of what we're being programmed to be afraid of. Not consciously programmed, maybe consciously, but unconsciously programmed to be in fear. Because fear allows people to be controlled. And fear allows that part of you that is not your friend to control you. You know, the master, what is a master? What is this self-mastery we talk about? I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. You have to discover that. You have to discover that inside of yourself, in your heart. To the best of my knowledge, to the best of my experience, that's the purpose of why we're here. The why do I exist becomes find out why you exist. Any questions? You can unmute yourself if you have a question. Or maybe you can't. Hang on. Uh, okay. No questions? What if you have experienced so much suffering that sometimes you wish you had not been born? You know, I'm writing a book about this because I think many people have had that thought that we have experienced, experienced so much suffering. And it's true for many people that there is this unbearable suffering, unbearable, that a human being can experience. And sometimes experience it over and 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 over again. Sometimes to the point where life seems hopeless. And, you know, I've been there. I've been there. There's a beautiful poem. I think I have a poem for almost everything in this Kindle. Um, I wish I had all these poems in my brain. Rilke. It's possible I am pushing through solid rock in flint-like layers as the ore lies alone. I am such a long way in. I see no way through and no space. Everything is close to my face and everything cl 
close to my face is stone. I don't have much knowledge yet in grief, so this massive darkness makes me small. You be the master. Make yourself fierce, break through. Then your great transforming will happen to me and my great grief cry will happen to you. You know, you read a poem like that and it's like, well, yep, this guy knew difficulty in his life, this guy knew grief. And the next poem that I have in here is also his. And I think this speaks to the answer. And it says, God speaks to each of us as he makes us, then walks with us silently out of the night. These are the words we dimly, dimly hear. You. You sent out beyond your recall. Go to the limits of your longing. Embody me and make big, flare up like flame and make big shadows I can move in. Let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going, no feeling is final. Don't let yourself lose me. Nearby is the country they call life. They call life. You will know it by its seriousness. Give me your hand. You know, and so that's the way to deal with so much, so much suffering. It's like, don't push it away. Don't tell yourself stories to make it right or okay. Because it sucks. But just keep going. Don't lose sight of God within, in your heart. To make a pot or a teapot, a beautiful teapot, the potter has to torture the tea, uh, the clay, excuse me. To make tea, you have to torture the tea, you have to pour boiling water on the poor things. Poor leaves. I do it many times a day. <laughs> you know. To make anything out of metal, you have to melt the metal, you have to destroy it. You have to pull the ore from the ground and crush it and heat it up and purify it. And then it becomes something of beauty. And function. So, I mean, every, everybody has to deal with their difficulties in their own way. But the, the just keep going, don't lose sight of me, no feeling is final. <laughs> when, when, I, when my mind hears no feeling is final, it's like, well, isn't it over with already? If it's not final, why do I still have it? Why is it still here? Why am I still suffering? Versus letting go into the current of the Tao and allowing what comes to come and what goes to go as though it's all clouds. The root of suffering 
is always emotional suffering, is always hanging on to something, or trying to hang on to something that no longer exists. And we feel the loss so deeply. The losses are so real and so deep. More real and deeper is the next breath. More real and more critical is letting the past fade into the past. You know, why does the human brain choose, seemingly choose to relive painful situation after painful situation after painful situation in the mind? Why do we do that? We don't have to do that. It's not hardwired into us to suffer over the past. But we do it. And if we can choose to do that, we can choose to not do it. You know, things like heartbreak, things like being deceived, being lied to, these are such painful things. Beyond the capacity of a human being to handle, it seems, at times. Why don't they heal? In some people is the question. And it's because we recreate the past over and over again in our minds. If only what if, could have been, should have been, might have been. I do it, everybody does it. But the only thing that this stuff leads to is more pain. It just leads to more pain. And the purpose of life is not to feel pain. The purpose of life is to know yourself. It's a big, big gripe that I have with a lot of psychotherapeutic techniques because it's all about digging up and ruminating and understanding the past. But the past needs to be released. This is the lesson of ayahuasca. Like you're sitting in ceremony, the medicine is strong. One of these situations comes up, might come up. So much pain, so much pain. And then it's almost as though this being of ayahuasca says, do you wish to hold on to this or do you wish to release it? It doesn't exist. It actually does not exist. We're holding on to illusion. We're holding on to unreality. That causes the pain, that causes the suffering. That's what causes the suffering, is the holding on. I went through a very intense bodywork sessions sessions many years ago called Rolfing. I don't know if people still do this, but essentially the the Rolfer will find every possible point in your body that is holding emotional pain. And then you know it's holding emotionally emotional pain because it physically hurts when it's touched, and then dig their elbows or knees or 
fingers into that point until you let it go, until you release it. Excruciatingly beautiful. You know, but so much can be released by allowing the past to be the past. Letting it fade into memory, and letting those memories fade into nothingness. And being present to the breath, being present to the moment. So, one, you know, Kabir says so beautifully that you can't wait to do that until you die. He says, do you think ghosts are going to do it for you afterwards? If you don't break your chains in this lifetime, do you think ghosts are going to do it for you afterwards? The idea that somehow at death the soul will join with the ecstatic is nothing but a fantasy. What is now is what is then, because there is no then. It's only now. You have nothing now, you will have nothing then. If you make love with the divine now, in the next lifetime, which is the next moment, in the next moment, in the next moment, you will have the face of satisfied desire. So plunge into the ocean of consciousness. And Rumi says, let the drop of water that is you become a hundred mighty seas. This is the only way through. This is the only way through it all. And when we do that, we become closer and closer to being the master who sees things as they are. We become closer and closer to knowing that the whole world belongs to us. When you realize nothing is lacking, the whole world belongs to you. And doesn't that sound better than continuing to suffer? And maybe not even continuing to suffer, but continuing to hold on to the suffering. Any other questions? Please type them. Okay, so I'm going to take a two-minute break to set up here for the sound healing. Oh. It's a long question. I'll just, uh, I don't seem to so much to so much think about the bad or hurtful things that have been done to me so it's not a conscious decision or thought when i apparently automatically reject or refuse to engage with one who may hurt me i guess it's a habit at this point of not thinking which is better to trust your instincts or ponder and roll thoughts over in your mind 
Um, I think instincts, I think the best thing is to pay attention to the gifts that are in front of, gifts that are in front of you and choose from your heart, make the choices from the place of love, see it from the vantage point of love. And, you know, if you're not seeing it from the vantage point of love, find the vantage point of love. And if you're not seeing it from the vantage point of love, find the vantage point of peace. You know, our natural state, the natural state of the human being, of homo sapiens sapiens, is consciousness is joy, is harmony, is peace. This is our natural state. Natural great peace. It's not an idea. It's what is when this is paying attention to the heart. and not paying attention to the thoughts or the instincts. Uh, I think I answered, didn't I? Is there more, Harriet? Do you want to say something? No, okay. Yeah. You know, I could never I could never tell anybody what to do or what not to do. It's not my job. It used to be. I gave that up. Cuz nobody ever did what I told them to do anyway. You know, stop eating those Big Macs. No, I love my Big Macs, you know. <laughs> They're going to kill you. I love my Big Macs more. <laughs> So I gave up on that. But you know, it's about it's about everything we've been talking about, about consciousness, about knowing yourself, about finding yourself, about diving deep into the ocean that you are. You know, it's like there's two two phases of a human life. before turning within and after turning within, before finding what you are and after finding what you are. One is like a dream and often a very bad dream. The other one is a freedom. Even though bad things still happen, even though the pain still comes. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says to Arjuna, victory and pain, victory and defeat, pleasure and pain, joy and sadness are all the same. And they're all the same because they're just part of that dream. that these times, that every time, but these times are giving us a chance to wake up from. How deep can you appreciate your next breath? How deeply can you trust yourself? How deeply can I let go of everything that I want and accept the gifts that are given? There's a reason this is called the hero's path. The hero's path is not easy. 
nothing easy about this. At least I haven't found it to be easy in my own life. But it's beautiful. It's truly beautiful. Truly transformative. Truly magical. Yeah. We'll see you in a couple minutes. So close your eyes and take a deep breath. And just recognize where you are in time and in space. And feel your body sitting or lying down where you are. Letting each breath carry you deeper. Gently focusing on the space between your eyebrows. Gently breathing. Gently allowing yourself to be breathed so that no conscious effort is going into your breathing. You're just allowing yourself to observe your breath as it fills you and releases you, as you fill up and there's a pause, and as you breathe out and there's a pause. The stars are setting Hushed are the movement of birds in their nests, of monsters in the deep. And you are the just who knows no change, the equity that does not swerve, the everlasting that never passes away. The doors of kings are locked and guarded by their henchmen, but your door is open to those who call upon you. My Lord, each lover is now alone with his beloved. And I, I am alone with you.
If I adore you, out of fear of hell, burn me in hell. If I adore you, out of the desire for paradise, lock me out of paradise. But if I adore you for yourself alone, let me bask in your eternal beauty. in my soul. There is a temple, a shrine, a church, a mosque, where I kneel. Prayer should bring us to an altar where no walls or names exist. Is there not a region of love where the sovereignty is illumined nothing? Where ecstasy gets poured into itself and becomes lost? Where the wing is fully alive but has no mind or body? In my soul, there is a temple, a shrine, a mosque, a church that dissolves, that dissolves into love. Thank <laughs> you. 
Each being has an ultimate capacity for joy, but none for suffering. Sown in our daily world are the seeds of joy and pain, acting as catalysts they affect us. How one feels in these moments is as personal as can be. Two people who have gone through the same tragedy will be affected differently. Whatever the situation is, it all seems so final. However, some situations you can do something about, while the laws of nature determine others. To climb a mountain takes courage and strength, yet to overcome the cliffs of despair takes even greater courage and strength. 
This is still not outside the realm of human possibilities. Hope, then, is the only beacon we have to continue. When suffering comes, it is time to go on rather than stop. It is time to accept rather than reject. It is time to look forward rather than backward. It is the time to understand rather the quest rather than question. As with the potter kneading the clay, brings the clay to its stage of transformation into a vessel in loss, not all is lost. For memories are left to be cherished in darkness. In darkness, light is needed. In confusion, clarity is needed. In despair, hope is needed. Remember that life goes on. Remember that life evolves. Remember that in hopelessness lies hope. Know that even in your darkest hour, you will never be abandoned. Thank you.
In my hallucination, I saw my beloved's flower garden. In my vertigo, in my dizziness, in my drunken haze, whirling and dancing like a spinning wheel, I saw myself as a source of existence. I was there at the beginning and I was only the spirit of love. Now I'm sober. There is only a hangover in the memory of love and only the sorrow I yearn for happiness, I ask for help, I want mercy, and my love says, look at me and hear me, because I am here just for you. I am your moon and your moonlight. I am your flower garden and your water. I am the sun and the stars in the heavens. I have come all this way looking for you. Without shoes or shawl, I wish you to laugh, to kill all your worries, to love you, to nourish you. Oh, sweet bitterness, 
I will soothe you and heal you. I bring you roses. I too have been covered with thorns.
Oh, marvel. A garden amidst the flames. My heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture for gazelles and a convent for monks and a temple for idols and the pilgrims, Kaaba, and the tables of the Torah and the book of Quran. I follow the religion of love wherever, whatever way love's caravan takes. Love is my religion and my faith. The master sees things as they are without trying to control them. He lets them go their own way and resides at the center of the circle. She understands that the universe is forever out of control and that trying to dominate events goes against the current of the Tao. Be content with what you have. Rejoice in the way things are when you realize that nothing is lacking. The entire universe belongs to you. And so we end where we started. Take a few deep breaths and gently stretch and open your eyes.